uh, we're very proud of our record at Polaris about how we were able to, uh, to make that happen. Now I, I'll have to say that a lot of it has been a diversification strategy by our CEO. You know, we, there are no standalone snow wheel companies anymore. It's impossible. So we became an ATV company in the 80s. We're into motorcycles. We're into power generation. We're into electric vehicles. So if you guys need any GEM electric motor cars for your security team, you let me know. <laughs> um, so we have done a lot of acquisitions, which, is, which have helped us diversify, and it has, has allowed us to weather some of these storms. So keeping that alignment is really difficult. So how have we responded to some of these challenges? Again, they're around demographics. They're around low unemployment. The statewide unemployment rates right around 4.4, 4.5% right now. Roseau counties, which isn't the only county we pull, from, pull labor from, but it fluctuates between 3.4 and 4.3% depending on the month. So it's a lot of times it's even lower than the statewide average. And if you, you know, I don't know if there's any science to it, but when I talk to members of the Capitol, I think most policymakers suggest that you get down around that 3%, 3.2%, and you're talking about pretty much full employment. Gosh, that's tough for us. Yeah. You know, well, where are we going to get people from? So especially when we have a a one-to-one -one ratio of hires to, lo to loss. For our, our, so every position we hire each year, we lose one person annually. So it becomes a real challenge for us. You know, turnover isn't huge, but there are folks that come in, take advantage of some of the things that we do on the front end of their employment here, and then they move on. So we run into those challenges too. So some of those things that we do to incent folks is we've increased our starting pay. In fact, we just had a 2.8% increase from 2014 to 2015. We have an employee referral bonus, a community referral bonus, trying to encourage people to talk to other members in their community, keep them here, keep them in Roseau. Keep them in Roseau County, Pennington County, Lake of the Woods County. Relocation bonuses we pay out. Signing bonuses, retention incentives. So. How do we not only focus on recruitment, but then we need to retain people. So sometimes the, the community um, isn't to their liking if we pull from somebody else. You know, they come here, they might come with a spouse. And we not only have to worry about how do we get the employee on the job, get them integrated into the community, but then how do we make sure that the spouse who's at home who might not have a job is trying to find a job gets themselves integrated into the community or if they come with a child. You know, getting them into the schools, getting them to be a part of that community. It's pretty easy um, from the perspective of it's a small town. You know, everybody goes to the hockey games on Friday night. Um, but when you have a spouse going away to work for, you know, eight, nine, ten hours a day, and the other spouse is sitting at home, you know, brand new to the community, doesn't know anybody, that presents challenges in and of itself. So we, we also work with the city of Roseau and Roseau County on integration programs to try and help uh, spouses and children get integrated into the community when we bring people in from outside of Rosa County, outside of Minnesota. <clears throat> so some of the ways that we've had to think creatively about our headcount challenges are last year for the first time, we have a Monterey, Mexico plant. We implemented a workforce sharing program where we brought workers from Monterey, Mexico up to Roseau. Now we come from a very diverse community here, but Roseau is not so diverse. So getting those folks integrated into the community, even if it was on a short-term basis, was a challenge. We talked to Mayor Pulowski, the, the city council, the county commissioners, the banks, um, some of the bigger um, employers in the district or in, in the community. Um, hospitals, things like that, and made sure that everybody understood that we were implementing this program. The challenge we ran into is that there was a lawsuit in Florida which shut, that actually had a significant impact on the H2B visa program and is our ability to do that program going forward 
um, is no longer available to us. So we have had to hire temporary workers on a short-term basis <coughs> working with a company. The problem we run into there is we do have about 150 temporary workers in our plant each day. So two key challenges with that. Quality control, they're temporary, they don't, you know, they get onboarded pretty quickly. And they cost about $150 more per person per day to employ than what a full-time equivalent Polaris employee would cost. So we've also transferred employees from Milford, Iowa and Osceola, Wisconsin. In fact, it wasn't so long ago that, you know, I was working on the line. You know, some people from corporate, we had accountants and lawyers and marketing people up on the line working. To tr you know, we need to keep the line going because the uh, down line is lost revenue, lost revenue hurts everybody. So especially when we're a company that is big into profit sharing. So um, we really do have some challenges. So let me talk about some of the costs associated with, with our labor challenges. We've had to go far and wide. We've had to increase the radius by which we market that Polaris has good paying jobs up in Roseau, Minnesota. So we, we've taken advantage of everything from social media, radio, television. The most interesting one I find here are the pull tab flyers <laughs> and the movie theater intros and the Lutheran prayer books. So I don't know about you, but on Sunday morning, I'm really not planning to uh, see a Polaris advertisement inside my prayer book. But those are the lengths that we've had to go to. I get letsplayhockey.com. Again, uh, we're a big hockey community up there. Um, you know, explore Minnesota, elsewhere. We've really looked for more sources, but the further distance we go, the more costs there are. Um, we've also focused on veterans. So um, we've reached out to uh, veterans groups. We work with the Department of Defense to, and the Veterans Administration to try and encourage folks to look at Polaris once they're done with being active duty. Um, we've gone to cities in I Illinois where Whirlpool or other manufacturers might have a plant shut down and we recruit there. <coughs> um, you know, we really try to be very creative. We work inside the school district. We work inside the Minsky system. Uh, you know, we, we really have an all the above strategy for trying to reach people. So once we get them in, you know, we have to worry about retaining them. But again, around getting them in, we have our compensation philosophy, which is really around attract, reward, and retain. And then the five principles around that are just like any, I mean, we work for a public company. Let's, I'm going to just speak frankly here. I'm a native Minnesotan. I hope you'll bear with me. Um, you know, we work hard. We work really, really hard at Polaris. We're a very lean, very flat, very fast organization. But our compensation philosophy helps support that. So we pay for performance. <clears throat> we need to make sure that our compensation philosophy is aligned with shareholders. Interestingly enough, our ESOP, our Employee Stock Options Program, is this, employees are the second largest owner of Polaris. So that's pretty impressive for a public company. Um, you know, I, I just can't say enough about that. Profit sharing last year paid out over $40 million to employees, including hourly workers, not just lawyers and accountants and marketing people. So we've, uh, we've really taken on um, a really focus on, on a, creating a long-term success, retaining employees, but we're also very market driven. So some of our compensation goals are to be, of course, competitive on pay, reward people for hard work, and remain cost competitive. And you know, I love this line, Scott Wine, our chairman and CEO, about the fundamental um, nature of our cultures that employees share and the success that they themselves work to create. And that really plays out every day at Polaris. 
So I really want to just show this um, chart more or less to show how we've seen increases in wages, referral bonuses, signing bonuses. These are all really in response to the labor shortage. So I think the fundamental question today's, today's conversation is how do we address um, you know, the income gap through job creation. It's kind of a chicken or the egg for Polaris. You know, we create jobs when there's demand for our products. So do you create the demand first or do you create the job first? And so we, we run into this conundrum internally. Um, we're lucky that we've had demand, so we've needed jobs. And because we've needed jobs and there's been a labor shortage, we've increased pay. It's a pretty simple uh, equation. So we've, you can see that we've been very competitive. Um, and then on the retention side, we've, we've done a lot of things around you know, flex attendance for line workers. That doesn't happen. You know, we, we, but for key employees who have some longevity with the company and have had good performance, um, we, we look at those opportunities. Uh, unpaid vacation opportunities, so they get more vacation as long as it's unpaid, retention raffles, things like that, and then of course profit sharing. So <clears throat> let me just focus on assembly because this is really the key issue for us, is how do we keep, get people on the line? So an assembly job, we require a high school diploma or, or a GED. And so if you look at some of the key metrics that we use to measure, you know, how are Minnesota employers doing on wages? So poverty, a family of one, you can see there at the bottom, the poverty family of two, and frankly, the Minnesota minimum wage is the second line in the green, uh, and family of three in the orange line. And then you have the average statewide wage by hour. Polaris is pretty competitive when you look at our total compensation package, so profit sharing, and so on and so forth. We're, we're pretty darn competitive. And, I would, and if you even look at that line, um, you know, I think most employers are pretty competitive on wages. I mean, you can, you, can have a, uh, you can have a pretty good life, especially in a small community like Rosa, where the cost of living is substantially lower in some respects. So here's how Polaris competes with our market. So we have five grades of line employees. So this is you know, a number of different factors to determine what grade you're at. But Polaris to the market, we're ahead of the market for hourly base rate for all grades. We're ahead of the market for all grades in terms of total compensation. So this would include you know, their base wage, their other, um, you know, other compensation, as well as their profit sharing. So let me just talk for a couple minutes about affordable housing, because this is a big issue at the Capitol right now. This is big time in the, in the, uh, the news. As you can see, so the challenges that we have with housing in Rosa, we don't have enough homes for people, even if we had them. Uh, high cost of building materials, labor shortage, changes in building codes, so it costs more to create homes these days and low appraisals are the big challenges for housing in greater Minnesota. Uh, by way of an example, the Parkland Place project, it was a, that was the culmination of a project that started when we went to the Capitol last year and worked with Senator Leroy Stumpf, a Democrat from um, Greater Minnesota, and Dan Fabian, a Republican uh, member of the House of Representatives from Roseau. Uh, we created a deed, helped with, worked with DEED to create a program for workforce housing grants. It was a pilot project. And that pilot project wound up um, getting, Rosa was awarded the first grant. And along with that DEED money and then other funding mechanisms, we broke ground on a $3.3 million market rate housing project. The goal was $110,000 per unit, rent of $850 per month. The appraised value came in at $71,000. So as a person who's helping underwrite some of the costs of that project, you're like, no way. So we really had to cobble together a funding mechanism through you know, the grant with DEED. Um, some one of the speakers later today is Kevin McKinnon. We worked with his team on that. Um, great team there at Deed. Uh, the de developer um, who was from Roseau and had another property in Roseau put out a second mortgage on that property. The city provided loans as well as second mortgage to some of their own property. 
they had a bank loan, and then the Economic Development Authority uh, gifted the land, $60,000 worth of land, to this project. So we got, you know, I think 30 units out of that. You know, we'll come, on, we'll come online here soon. We have the Tamarack Place project, which Polaris themselves contributed $300,000 to another market rate uh, project that's um, in the works. So these are challenges that are not just felt by Polaris, not just felt by communities like Rozo. I mean, this is Worthington, Wadena, um, Purim, Detroit Lakes, you name it. This is a challenge everywhere. And you go to any member of the legislature, and they've all heard about it, and most of them have probably introduced legislation to it. So House File 1, which is <clears throat> a big omnibus bill, uh, has a workforce housing grant program in it. So Representative Rod Hamilton, down from southwestern Minnesota, represents big egg uh, producers. Um, egg has a similar problems as manufacturing does around workforce. So he, Dan Fabian, and others in the House um, have worked on workforce housing grants. House File 848 creates a tax to commit financing authority for local jurisdictions so that they can help underwrite some of the costs through taxpayer um, uh, do, you know, short-term tax authority so that those investments can be made in infrastructure. And then the same thing is true over in the Senate. So this is really a nonpartisan issue. This is being felt by everybody. So <clears throat> I want to, this is, I was reading through some deed material and I, I found this really interesting because Polaris, I mean, we're, we have to bring in new workers, but then we need to retain them. So the takeaway that I had from this slide was we're pretty good on average wages as it comes to a cost of living perspective. The orange is the average wage on a monthly basis. And that's the cost of living on a monthly basis in Northwest Minnesota versus the metro. So we're, you know, people are taking home, you know, 10 to 20 percent. You know, they're able to put away, hopefully, towards retirement. Um, but when they start out, this is what Deed is saying is the start, average starting wages on a monthly basis. And that's a challenge. You know, how do you get from the starting wage to a living wage? How long do you have to grind it out? That's a big challenge. You know, Polaris has responded, as you can see, by being very, very competitive with the market. <clears throat> so, you know, this is a regional perspective. Polaris, you know, if you were to go back and run the numbers, and I did, I, don't ha I wish I had them up there, but we exceed the cost of living for starting wage. Now, we have to do that because we need to be competitive with everyone else. But if not, if we don't have kind of a, you know, Let's, let's lift the ship, like, you know, the high tide lifts all ships approach. Then we run into challenges. It caught, you know, if not everybody is willing to be competitive, and only some are, it just, the natural progression is to increase wages for, every, for, you know, businesses that are willing to go the extra mile to try and make sure that we can attract and retain employees. So, again, I think going back to my initial point is this is a big community. This is all Minnesota. This is a kind of a all the above approach. I almost view this as unacceptable, that we shouldn't require people to have to grind it out, you know, not be able to, to take care of basic necessities before they, can, before they can make it. Is that why we have flight? Is that why people aren't coming back? I don't know. These are, these are questions. We're at an academic institution. I, I, I love this part of it. So I bring that and ask you all that. So the key takeaways <clears throat> for me, low unemployment plus net out migration, we have a head coach challenge. Low enrollment in our K through 12 institutions, Minsky system, plus a decrease in trades programs, future head coach challenge. Competition for labor, low unemployment, increased cost to run our manufacturing facility in Roseau, increased cost of essentials, housing, gas, et cetera, increased wage demand. So Polaris is really between a rock and a hard place. So, with that, I think I'm on time. Yeah, and I think Brian can go six. So, do you want to start your video? So, you guys want to see the cool part?
Bag it up. We had it earlier. No. So, anyways, I'll just while I wrap up, I'll just let you guys watch. <laughs> but you know, as I think this is a good illustration of the fact that Polaris isn't what it used to be. You know, we started out as a snowmobile company. You saw some of the the photographs. Um, we're a much more diverse company today, and we're you know the interesting part about I mentioned Tom Box District and the number of people that have Power Sports products. Um, this it it really is a community. You know, we go to Polaris every day and um, we work hard, and our goal is to make the Power Sports experience better. Um, interestingly enough, just real quick, I work in government relations. I because I'm in government relations, I get to be really agnostic about this stuff, you know. <laughs> Some of our biggest champions in the U.S. Congress are Senator Amy Klobuchar and Eric Paulson. Okay, so, you know, uh, Amy Klobuchar was one of the chief sponsors of the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act, which had a limitation on lead in children's toys, which presented challenges for us in the development of our all-terrain vehicles and our snowmobiles for kids. So I would challenge all of you to say how many of your kids are going to go around licking their snowmobile? <laughs> Not many. So we worked with Senator Klobuchar and, and helped solve that challenge for Polaris. Um, you know, we're into the electric industry, so we, we purchased this, this electric uh, technology for motorcycles. So Representative Eric Paulson sits on Ways and Means, which has jurisdiction over tax policy. He's been a big champion of that for us. So um, not only at the federal level, but at the state level, um, we've worked closely with Governor Dayton on a number of issues. So we really are uh, you know, trying to make the experience better for everybody, regardless of all these things that you read in the news sometimes that divide us. So that's Polaris. I don't know. We're going to open it up to questions. I think if everyone just uses their teacher's voice, they can stand up and ask their question and then they ask. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm from Plymouth, Minnesota. I'm a small business owner, and I'm one of those international students that came 40 years ago and stayed and started the business. I have a comment first. I like that graph where you show it. Middle one in the green that people were not making enough to cover the cost of living. Obviously, they're not making enough to cover the cost of living. They don't have money to buy a snowmobile either. So <laughs> there's an incentive there to fix that. But uh, my question is this uh, there's an ongoing argument whether government is part of the solution or part of the problem. So I'd like to hear your view how Polaris looks at government if it is a friend. <laughs> Good question. Um, as I mentioned, I'm from Minnesota, so I'm, a little, you know, I try to be pretty frank and honest with people, and, and I should say that these comments may not be Polaris's comments in some instances. So um, there's a little nuance there, but um, I would say that frenemy. Um, and I say that honestly, and I think that would be the general position of Polaris, too. Um, as I mentioned, there's been a number of instances where members of the legislature, the governor's office, um, agencies like DEED we've worked closely with, have been really, really valuable to helping us so solve some of these challenges around wages, around whether our products are legal, um, so on and so forth. I've tried to you know, talk about how we work in a nonpartisan way. Um, I think this conversation is around how does the public sector, private sector, nonprofit sector come together to solve challenges, and I think that Polaris would agree that all three of those elements are critical. So we think that um, government can certainly be a valued uh, partner in solving some of these challenges. The workforce housing issue is one of those, and I'll, I'll give you an example why. So there have been times where we've been asked, if you have a workforce housing shortage in Rosa, why don't you build homes for your workers? And the challenge 
is that we're really, really good at building power sports products. We're really, really bad at real estate. So um, we, our shareholders would not allow that. You know, I'm a shareholder. I don't see the value in Polaris partnering with developers, um, you know, breaking ground, uh, bringing in labor, cost of materials, all those things, and you know, tackling that on their own. Plus, the largest tax entity, taxed entity in Rosa County is Polaris. So there is some incentive on behalf of the community because those tax dollars are used for other investments that don't, don't, don't go directly back towards Polaris. For there to be a partnership between Polaris, and, and I, I told you that we invested $300,000 towards one project. We weren't the only finance arm of that project, but the city was, private developers were, nonprofits. I think someone from the Northwest uh, Housing Finance Authority is gonna be here later today. So we work with nonprofits as well to try and bring a total package together. And that was really what you saw when I talked about Parkland Place, is it, it really was, you know, we cobbled together this package and all three of those silos came together to create a solution. So um, now, uh, some would argue that on the, on the enemy side of the frenemy equation, that, you know, regulations have costs, things like that. Um, I work in that environment and I, and I can tell you that they do. Um, I'll give you by, by way of an example. Indiana, Indiana uh, we just introduced a new product called Slingshot. You might have seen a couple of them, they're really awesome. So if you, if you wanna test drive one, let me know. Um, but there are three wheel motorcycles. So Indiana had a definition for a motorcycle which was just off by one little piece. And so we couldn't sell Slingshot. Yet the regulatory agency had discretion to overlook that in the short term as we worked collaboratively with the legislature and had already received Governor Mike Pence's agreement that he would sign a bill to update the statute. So they had regulatory discretion to essentially provide temporary licensure for those products. They decided not to. That's well within their purview, but what that does is it doesn't just impact Polaris. It impacts our 60 independently owned small businesses that wanted to retail those products. And it's not, this isn't a corporate issue. This is, you know, the average Polaris dealership has a staff of seven. I mean, they're a small business. You know, they're trying to make a payroll. And they're, they're planning on, I mean, you know, we have this thing called our um, vitality index, and that means the, the, the percentage of our revenue that comes from new products that were introduced in the last three years. And we have to keep that above 70% to remain competitive. So we have to introduce new products continuously in order to remain competitive with a very competitive market as you saw. I mean, we go up against John Deere, we go up against Honda, uh, Harley Davidson. To take that out of the market because of, you know, this is how we've always done it, didn't make a whole lot of sense to us when it got down to the, the nitty gritty of the ground. How do people plan to expand? How do they expand their business and then therefore pay higher property taxes? You know, and then make a payroll or hire new people, which then, you know, you look at the cyclical nature of how consumer and business works together. You know, that's where we see the, the challenges sometimes is where decisions can sometimes be arbitrary if you don't look at the big picture and what the impact is not. I mean, you're not just affecting Polaris, you're affecting everyone all the way down through the chain. So that's my honest answer. <laughs> yes? Uh, outside of the housing and recruitment issues, what do you see as the positives or the advantages for being in Rosa County? The, the things you hear all, all, all the time about the, what makes Minnesota great. We work hard, there is no doubt. As I mentioned, I travel a lot. Um, and there, there are two things that stick out. We seem to find solutions here. That's what makes Minnesota great. We're, we really do work hard and we come together as a community. That's another great thing about 
Rose O as the community and everybody knows each other. It's represented Dan Fabian who was a, a Phi Ed and track coach. And every time I bring him to the plant, it takes me like three times as long to get through there as I would hope because he knows everybody, you know? So um, the hard work, small community, I mean, even though it has its challenges, it's also great because, you know, people get along there because what you do is when you leave work, your, your kids are on the same baseball team or you go to the same church, things like that. So you kind of have to take a different approach to people. Um, Speaking, kind of tying your question to his is, you know, sometimes bureaucracy can get in the way of things, even at Polaris. You know, our CEO says that one of the biggest challenges he has is to make sure that bureaucracy doesn't slow down decision making at Polaris because we have to, we're such a competitive market. Um, speed is our biggest competitive advantage with our competitors. So what might take three or four meetings to get done at our corporate facility takes a conversation between two people in Roseau. And, you know, in the instance that I'm talking about is where I, I tried to get a snowmobile and an ATV for a nonprofit in Michigan, you know, the city of Detroit went through bankruptcy. So one of the things that they did is they were, <clears throat> they were given an island within Lake Michigan and they created an outdoor experience center and they asked Polaris for a donation to help, you know, create these virtual simulators so kids could get in there and learn about, you know, how to use ATVs and snowmobiles properly. Well, I asked for one within our business unit. It's like, well, I don't know, and blah, 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 blah. I had to go through three people to finally get a no. And I go up to Rosa and I just happened to have a conversation with somebody and I said, you know, gosh, you know, I've been looking for these snowmobiles and these ATVs. He's like, what color do you want? <laughs> within 24 hours, I had them. You know, it's just that sort of thing. It's, 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 it's asking people, you know, that same day, talking to another person saying, hey, uh, I just got a phone call from somebody. There's going to be a goose hunt for disabled veterans uh, tomorrow morning. At, they're meeting at 4.30 in the morning, and we need some, some rangers, ranger crews, to get out there to help transport these veterans. I'll be there. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but, I mean, I think it happens a lot more here in Minnesota than it does elsewhere, but, you know, it's those, it's those small towns, those places where we came from. That, that's still people's mentality. That's what I love about Rozo, and that's frankly one of the things that we try and sell people on. So. One of the things we hear is that um, it's the labor participation rate yes. that's an issue. Uh, and with the conversation that's been going on in the Capitol, St. Paul, uh, relative to education, uh, is it your view that we've got it in balance far as reaching out to uh, get skills to individuals such as trade schools in supporting that educational need in context of the entire education bill? You know, <laughs> that was a yes or no. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm a lawyer, so it's maybe. Um, you know, that's. In the context of that particular, of the legislation that's going through right now, um, I'm, I'm gonna say no, especially on skilled trades. And, it's, and I don't know that it's necessarily a, that a piece of legislation can solve that is kind of where the maybe comes in. Um, I think it really is an, an issue of perception. You know, obviously as I showed you earlier, you know, Polaris pays a competitive wage where if you wanna live in Northwest Minnesota, you can take care of your basic needs. So that, that chart was showing a two person household with a child. So Polaris's wage can more than meet your basic needs, I think by like 20%, we're 120% of what the monthly cost of living is. So does that mean your kid should leave Roseau County and go to, you know, no offense to Hamlin or any other higher education institution, I, I owe you guys a lot of money. Um, but do they need to go there? You know, and, or can they stay in their home community, close to family, close to the things that they grew up loving to do? Um, or do we have to work on the perception of parents and say, your kid doesn't have to have a STEM degree in order to be successful in this world? So um, I think that's a bigger challenge, not so much, you know, where the money's going, 
but we really need to address the perception. I think there was an article in the Star Tribune just the other day, you might have seen it, where there was a Georgetown study a few years back that talked about the number of jobs that would, be, that would require some sort of advanced training beyond high school and how that was a little bit out of whack with reality. Well, I, I would suggest that it's, we just, we need to figure out where we're competitive. I think that's, that's good. You know, we want, need to make investments in higher education. We want to be high tech and all those things. We want to be competitive with like the Raleigh Durham North Carolinas and things like that. But, you know, not everybody needs to be an engineer. Not everybody needs to be a mathematician and, you know, so on and so forth. So, yes. Given that um, basically you, you're selling products to people that, that need some discretionary income, and given that one of the things we keep hearing about, and I think most of us experience, is the concentration of wealth and a concentration of income in this country, it would seem to me that one of your longest term concerns would be playing a role in addressing that disparity. So what is, what is the thinking at Polaris about uh, how much that concentration of wealth and income has on your long term ability to survive as a Good question, and I think um, that is, you know, there's some general truth to that. Um, the average weight or the average annual income of an owner of our products is $60,000. I mean, and you didn't see a big dip during the recession. So I, I don't know if it's something organic about our people, our consumers, um, but you know, they like what they do. That video, if you had, had the sound, you would have, the commentary behind it was really about how this is a community. And this is, it really is, a, it stems from where Polaris came from, a small town. People knew each other. Um, they came together as a community and created a, you know, what I think is an American success story in manufacturing. And that extends to our customers. We try to create communities. And people will scrimp and save and do what they can regardless of what their income is, to try and, you know, have something to do with their kid on the weekend. Well, a minute ago you were talking about uh, this perception and this decision that parents make about how much education their kids need. Yep. So my kids just graduated from college, and I'm worried about uh, how much they're going to be able to earn in the future. And I'm certainly not going to make a decision that they should take an hourly wage job when I don't know whether or not this concentration of wealth is going to continue and whether or not they're going to need that college education Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have an argument against that. I think it's, like I said, there's something organic in the system. Um, you know, all I can say is from Polaris's perspective, uh, we have embraced Minnesota and kind of what, where we came from and who we are today. I mean, it's, it's intricately tied to our brand. Um, and because of that, we have been very competitive on wages. Some of that is, is upward pressure or pressure from below because of the market, the shortage of labor, so on and so forth. And we've had to be creative. Um, and we, you know, between, like I showed you earlier, is the wages that we pay about 20%, you know, of their, of their wages that they take home, they're able to pocket or invest elsewhere. And, um, you know, so I can speak to Polaris, but I also was clear that I don't think that, I think Polaris, we go the extra mile, but I'm not suggesting that all businesses do, or I don't think, you know, I just can't say that with certainty. Yes? I'm surprised that as a manufacturing company, you haven't talked about labor productivity at all. Um, what are you thinking about in terms of increased automation or robotics to get a Um, You know, that's a good question. We, we have become increasingly automated in the last few years. I mean, I, I, I don't know that of a manufacturer that hasn't, and a lot of it has been in response to um, labor costs. Um, but, you know, we, I think with some automation, you run into quality issues from time to time, shut, you know, shutdowns. Um, you, you run into some of the same problems that you have when you deal with people. So we have not, you haven't seen, uh, you know, a decrease over the last 10 years of our headcount at Roseau. I think, I think some of that is 
is really tied to just kind of our culture, our heritage. We, you know, and then some of it is tied to the fact that our own internal feeling is that you run into some of the same challenges, some of the same costs, you know, through automation that you run into with labor. You don't always get the best product with automation. Um, you know, and frankly, the way you put together our products, I mean, I've worked on the line. Um, they're pretty complex machines to come together and put together. And we like having, you know, hands do that, human hands. So it's just, it's kind of a cultural thing, but then it also is a cost. And, you know, how much is there to save versus how much there is to gain or how much there is to um, build out? You know, I think there's just kind of an open-ended question on that. Yes? So, I'm going to make some assumptions in your question. Um, so, are you suggesting that the types of products that we create may not align with some of the philosophies of the future labor market? No, um, in the ads, I realize those were probably customers that you were focusing on. Yeah. The ads, they're all white. Okay. So Absolutely. Outside. Yes, yes, yep. No, absolutely. Um, you know, marketing does their thing. I'm a, I help create policy, so I do another thing. And trust me, I get this all the time because I, I generally don't show that at the Capitol so, uh, because they're like, oh, you know, come on. You really have to jump those things that high? Um, so those are all professionals, by the way. Uh, but no, to your point, um, I would s let me speak f generally from the business community's perspective. Um, Doug Baker, who is the head of one of our great companies here in the Twin Cities Ecolab right here in St. Paul, I, I had listened to him have a talk where he challenged the business community understanding that the, um, the graduation rates for minorities, is, there's, there's a big gap. And that with labor shortages that we have today, we're really going to depend on those diverse communities to lean on. We're going to have to lean on them as the labor market of the future. So um, I don't know that I can necessarily speak to how we align our marketing with our labor needs in the future, but what I can say is that the business community of which Polaris belongs and here in Minnesota is very, very cognizant of the importance of making sure that we're working on a broader array of issues than just you know where can people ride our products or where, where we can sell our products, but really around issues around workforce, transportation, um, housing, uh, because we, we understand that we're, we're really uniquely positioned that we have a very, very um, strong and diverse economy here in, in Minnesota. We have a very strong communities here in Minnesota. We need to be able to pull from everybody. So um, we don't, you know, we don't intentionally, if you want to say, uh, leave out anybody out of our advertising to the detriment of you know, future labor, but, and we are definitely focusing on diversity. Um, as I mentioned, I mean, I work with our engineering teams all the time because I need to make the arguments about why our products are safe, why our products um, are efficient from an air quality and noise quality perspective, and I deal with some of the, I swear we have some of the smartest people at Polaris. We have the best team in power sports for sure. Um, and I deal with people of all backgrounds, all races, all ethnicities every single day at Polaris. Even though, you know, we look like a very homogenous company, we are incredibly diverse. I mean, we were willing to take folks out of Monterey, Mexico. And if you remember a few years ago when we talked about closing our Osceola, Wisconsin plant and taking those operations to Monterey, we got smacked around by our customers, the media. Um, today, Osceola is bigger than it was. And Monterey is fully operational, and we have great workers there. One of the highest quality control quotients of any of our plants, and we brought them to Roseau. Don't see a lot of people from Monterey, Mexico, and Roseau. 
So, yes. Yep, no, I agree. And, and that's why I think what you saw out of that slide where when we're advertising, we're taking advantage of as many, you know, methods as we can. So, you know, the Lutheran prayer book is one, but, you know, we're on Pandora and Twitter and, you know, Facebook and Craigslist and everywhere else, you know, which are very, you know, th those reach all demographics of people. Um, so... You know, in terms of our advertising, our, you know, I don't, I would certainly not suggest that there is anything intentional about how we advertise our products. Um, but our, I think our marketing for our, I mean, our track record is pretty solid on um, diversification of our workforce. Yes. Sure. So the question was, if you didn't hear it in the back, was um, how are we working with other like organizations, if you will, that skilled trades organizations, um, to kind of come together around labor solutions? As I think, you know, I think was the the nut of your question. Um, it's a challenge. Um, what I would tell you is that each month, our HR team meets with the HR teams of Articat, DigiKey, Marvin Windows and central boilers, so the five companies all get together and talk about similar challenges that they have with developing employees, retaining employees, where are you gonna pull from? DigiKey right now actually runs a bus two times a week from Grand Fork 60 miles to bring employees in. So we're not to that point yet. We've created temporary housing, we brought workers up, things like that. So we talk about those sorts of solutions and try to think creatively, um, but you know, we're a large manufacturer, so we look to, if you look at our suppliers, which are also in our field, right? You know, they're skilled, they employ welders and machinists and things like that. It's an interesting dynamic because they're also our competition for labor. Our, our three largest suppliers across our product lines are all in northern Minnesota. You know, you know how hard it is to not go to team industries and say, Okay, we like that engineer and that engineer and that engineer, and we're gonna, you know. So it, it really is a dichotomy that that we haven't, you know, we haven't really figured out the the secret sauce of yet. I think maybe just another minute or two. One more. And then... Yeah, you mentioned that there's an employee stock ownership or option to plan ESOP, and I'm curious about two aspects. Um, what does this ESOP do in terms of employee retention? And Yeah, so the question was around our ESOP and how does that help with retention? And then, you know, in terms of kind of the global perspective of how do you encourage businesses to stay through like compensation and things like that, I think is what I heard you say. Um, the ESOP, as I mentioned, is the, the second largest owner of the company. So that is myself, my fellow employees. Um, that is a, in fact, I was talking with our HR team from Rosa last week and they said, that they need to do a better job in terms of talent management of encouraging folks to understand what the, you know, not just what their base wage is, but what their total compensation package is. So there's gonna be a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of need on employers too to do a better job of communicating with their people. And so, 
you know, that's always a creative tension, right? Is productivity, time on the line versus com communications meetings, things like that, you know? So that's, that's there's always a creative tension there. But I think the, from Polaris's long view is we need to take the time to do that because in the long run, it's gonna wind up paying dividends for us. In fact, I was talking to, um, it was last fall, we had our ATV Association Minnesota annual meeting and Polaris hosted it. The governor came, uh, Colin Peterson and other, bunch of other folks. And one of the individuals that was there had worked at Polaris for 30 years, high school education, and uh, had talked about how he retired a millionaire. Between his base compensation, being diligent on his, on his finances, his ESOP, his profit sharing, his 401k, all those things. And so what we try to do is we try to highlight examples like that, where, you know, if you're diligent, I mean, nothing against higher education. Trust me, I've got plenty of it. Um, but it's, you know, if you have employers who are trying to, trying to do the right things for their people, there are ways that you can grow up and stay in greater Minnesota. In terms of the business community generally and how we, how we, we do that, um, I don't want to say Polaris is unique um, in how we approach it because, I mean, like you said, I mean, there's a group of people who got together and they're probably all in a very similar boat. You know, they've got ESOPs for their employees and employees are owners and things like that. Um, I think it's, I, I think it's a, a, a larger uh, kind of social science question versus a, you know, hard science type of approach. It's really about what is the perception of how people can retain a job over time. You know, we have significant, I don't know what the numbers are, but I know that when I came to this institution, there were, I've had many conversations with folks about how, you know, how many times you change a career, you know, and, and how do you carry that wealth that you've accrued during the time of your service at one company onto another company, you know? And, and so I think that those are some of the challenges too. I mean, look at us. We, we would love to retain employees for 30 years. That's, you know, a lot of times that's not realistic. But if we can educate people on how important it is for retention for, in terms of your long term, I mean, look at it from the perspective of the stock market. You know, Polaris has gone way up, suffering a little bit of a dip right now in our share price, but in the long run, we'll be in good shape. And I think that's the approach that we have to take with encouraging people to look at the long game in terms of where they, where they live, where they work, where they play, all of those things. So total compensation-wise, if you stick at Polaris, you're gonna be in good shape you know, don't leave, please. Well, Thanks. can you join me in thanking JR's? Um, we're gonna take a quick, quick break, but we do need to get rolling again at 1045, so you, you get a little bit shorter break than we set, but in order to get everyone in, so if you can work on being back here and ready to go, we will see you in about 12 minutes. Sure, no problem. Good job. Yeah, thank you. One more question. I think this is. Then we'll be interested in this too. You said something that was so disappearing. You said you don't create jobs, demand creates jobs. Right? And of course, we have the legislators that when they start talking about job creation, the first thing they do is they say, we're going to give you tax when it
take advantage of all the tax incentives? Centers tax that comes in every year of the federal government, um, R&D tax credit, uh, manufacturing tax credit. In fact, we can to get advantage of the tax incentives. Um, but we do that because our competitors do. But if we want to be able to have a cross the board cut to simplify the tax code, we would gladly get rid of all these things. Because it becomes too complicated, it becomes too laborious, um, it changes all the time. You know, they have to be extended each year, so you're kind of in limbo for a time period, and it happens every single year. So if we could simplify the code, bring it down, make it competitive with the rest of the world, because we are truly a global economy.